Now let's move on to Indy, who's come directly from New Delhi this morning just for you. So please uh, pay attention. Hi, Filippo. Uh, hello. Uh, it's, I'm delighted to be here. I'm. It's been a brilliant conversation thus far. I've enjoyed listening to every one of the speeches, and I suppose I'm going to take the little mantle of actually asking some tough questions. Tough questions both for myself, but also some of the propositions that are being pulled up. Um, sorry, do you have this? So let's talk about social innovation. And I've put that up purposefully, just as a little sort of taster. Um, it's not, you know, we can class social innovation in many ways, but increasingly there's a tendency of social innovation to be understood through this lens. There's also another lens, Uber, uh, the sharing, sharing economy infrastructure, a lot of that lens. And let's talk about it quite critically. Uber and the sharing economy. Uber is perhaps slightly different, but let's talk about most of the sharing economy. Most of the sharing economy is just the fractional rental economy. Fractional rent. Fractional rent basically means corporates own the assets and they share those assets with you. What is the problem with this? Well, actually, you're stripping wealth from the population. So we need to become a little smarter about the language that is being used and how it's being co-opted. Sharing economy is not all good. Suddenly, if you're rent, in the UK, the, the idea that we should all rent our homes has been really pushed. Why? Because it actually allows for a rentier economy to be grown. Sharing. If I share with you as a human being, that may be sharing. But if I borrow off a corporate, that's called rent. Fractional rent maybe, but rent nevertheless. Let's keep going. This equation up there, why did I put it up? We've been hearing a lot amongst the speakers of saying it doesn't really matter if you're not for profit or for profit. Yeah, that's been the general, yeah, well, you know, it doesn't matter. Let's question that. Maybe they're both wrong. You thought I was going to say not-for-profit's better, right? No. Maybe they're both wrong. In the UK, we've seen not-for-profit CEOs taking 3,000 times the salary of the lowest-paid worker. 3,000 times the salary. Not for, uh, that's not-for-profits. And for-profits, well, we've seen what's happened. The huge structuring of wealth, Simon said it, 300 people in the U Europe and UK, top uh, Europe and US, have more wealth than 4.5 billion people. Repeat that. 300 people, top people in Europe and US, have more wealth than 4.5 billion people. Structural inequality. And that inequality is rising. Let's carry on going. Social enterprise. I set up a community interest company, had the privilege of doing, looking at a lot of these social enterprises, dogged by the same issues, ego, power at the center. So when you remove money as the incentive, actually reputation and other currencies come, in, come involved. Some of the tech companies, like Buffer, are innovating way in advance of that. Radical transparency about pay, radical transparency about, uh, about corporate ownership, they're doing that. So I'm not even saying social enterprise per se has got a key winning formula yet. And then public services. Too often, this agenda is basically a method to unload public services. That may be right, it may not be right. The journey we've been on, and this is the big political question we have to talk about, is that we are on a journey to basically financialize public good or social good, turning it into a financial commodity. I'm not going to say whether it's right or it's wrong, but it's worth recognizing that for us to have a really good debate about it. Then impact finance. Don't worry, I've, I've helped set up a fund as well, so I'm not sort of saying it from that lens. But let's look at impact finance. Well, impact finance centralizes morality. If you're an investor, I choose now. Well, I like your morality. Well, I don't like yours. 
What does that mean? My metrics, your metrics, at least the market was good. At least the idea of a fair, free market meant that I didn't care about your morality. Your morality was yours. I empowered you to do what you wanted to do. The free flow of capital did that. Impact finance can also open up a different discourse, which is not only are we centralizing capital, we're also centralizing morality. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying this is where we've got to. It was a great journey, and it's got us this far. I think the challenge that you have is to leapfrog this. The last 10 years that we saw grow out in the UK and, and all over the world was really important because it created the space for this conversation. My intuition, having been involved with it, and, you know, is that it's perhaps not the future. It perhaps requires deep philosophical and structural questioning. And in a way, there's really huge challenges appearing. In a sense, we're seeing the accumulation of soft power, hard power, many of the systems we talk about. Many, there's a great website called Dark Patterns. Have a look at it. It talks about how we create biases and power systems. Increasingly, many of the systems that we're talking about in social innovation also accrue soft power, and we don't know how to govern them. So I'm going to ask that I think we need a whole new institutional infrastructure for social innovation. We need a different way to look at the problem. Why? I think if you look at it, I think we're in a very serious decline of many of our democracies. Democracies are struggling to make the, address the systemic challenges. Climate change is just one. Structural inequality is another. I guarantee you we are locked into that discourse. Why? Because vested, vested interest has become dis, dis, sufficiently distributed and sufficiently locked in. So we have a challenge on our hand. I think if you have to talk about social, you have to talk about social in a five-headed sense. You have to talk about social both in outcome, in method, Climate change is one problem that you cannot solve through a technology. We've got the technologies. It's a social problem. It's a systemic problem of how we engage. Governance. Most of our governance systems increasingly don't work. We need to reinvent governance for the 21st century. Because most of you, most of you will know about non-exec directors in corporates. If I did a social network analysis of those non-execs, I guarantee you there'll be no more than 1.5 leaps away. Are they independent? Independent from who? I think we have to talk about governance in a completely new way. Ownership. I think we have to talk about ownership in a different way. We have to democratize assets. It's not just revenue, it's also assets. Too often, the last 20 years of the third way has been about redistribution of income tax. Actually, the key issue is wealth. Look at the concentration of wealth. And concentration of wealth in foundations, not-for-profits, or corporates. I think it's about people. It's about investing and empowering people. Look at what Germany's done in terms of distributed energy ownership. It's quite remarkable. They're laying the groundwork for a democracy. Why? Because unless you democratize capital, energy, and knowledge, you don't have a democracy. And inputs. How do you actually socialize your inputs? Simon said this earlier very eloquently. I think we're living in a very culture of thin conversations, and we're allowing the space to be hijacked by populism because we're not allowing for deep engagement around the issues. So, in a sense, my th question would be, maybe what we've done till now has been a good experiment, but is not the answer. And I think all countries that are coming forward now and to look at this domain, because I think systemically this is about dealing with a democratic crisis. It's about how we innovate in a new democracy. Requires you to leapfrog the conversation, not to fall into the same patterns. Much of impact finance has been hijacked by corporate financiers. 
Some very enlightened, some of them are sitting in this room, who are starting to challenge that model. But many are actually just borrowing venture capital fund structures, which we know don't even work in venture capital. 80% of venture capital funds don't produce above 80%, 80 um, of venture capital funds don't produce anything above public market returns. And we imagine those things will work in the social sector? Let us all laugh together, you know? It's, it's a joke. We need to really reinvent these institutions. And I don't blame them. They did a great job. It was great. We needed that done. Now there's a different moment. And in a way, the challenge we've got is how do we go from the top right to the top bottom. It ain't going to be social if it's just done by the top. Led by the few ain't going to be social in the long run. I guarantee you. We're going to have to create a movement which is led by the many. It, I was in Hub San Francisco, Impact Hub San Francisco, and brilliant conference. We were doing stuff. stuff. I walked out at night. It was about 12 o'clock at night. The level of fucking homelessness is unbelievable. And I was like, hold it. We had good cappuccino and great fair trade cappuccino, but outside my bloody door is this. So, you know, I was part of the team that helps us grow the Hub Network and sort of the Young Foundation are now supporting some of the whole story. But it's really interesting for me that actually hubs only exist in capital cities. If you look at where hubs exist, they exist in London, uh, Milan, you know, Geneva, Zurich. They don't exist in Rochdale, Ranchi. Come on, give me an R, Filippo. R in Italian. R, R Italian place. Okay, perfect. They don't exist there. They exist in these nice little places. They don't exist where the challenges are. And unless we start to rebuild our thinking from where those challenges are, I don't think we can address this problem. I was part of that. I, I, I want us to be disruptive of ourselves. It's a, that's very important. And in a way, the invitation I would say, this is a quick diagram of institution building in the UK. When we went down the Industrial Revolution in the UK, we built a shitload of institutions because we understood they created the rules and the frameworks of markets. We need to build, do the same for the 21st century, recognizing a new democracy and a new type of organization at the center of it. That is our challenge. You all know about the Impact Hub Network, 60 hubs. The thing I'm proud of, all locally owned, yet part of a network. A new civic globalization. Fab Labs have done the same. A new civic globalization. Yes, it's about scale, but scale done radically differently. 400 makers at the center of it that own many, many, there's 1,000, 1,500 new inquiries for hubs to be part of a global network. This is a way to build a new type of globalization. It isn't about localization, just being particular. It's about how do we create a new civic globalization. Sod that. Right. I think the challenge I set myself was, OK, if we wanted to reboot the hub network, how would we put a hub in places of greatest poverty? Not in London, not in Pall Mall, where I set up one hub. How would I put it in places of greatest poverty? That is a great question. It's fine for me to leave a corporate real estate prices in London and Pall Mall to make a home for entrepreneurs. Fine, it was a good job done. But actually, the real challenge is how do we get out there? And there are ways. Increasingly, tools like outcome financing and data, large-scale data science, are going to be very important in actually building a whole new framework. I can talk about this later. I'm not. I, in a way, how do we get 50 entrepreneurs to work together to hit a social problem? Because the challenge, if you want to talk about educational attainment in an area, is not just about the grades. It's about the food. It's about actually purpose. It's about time. It's about passion. It's about educational typologies. There's a hundred different things you have to hit in the ecosystem to drive the change. It isn't a single-stop solution. 
So if we want to talk about radical change, a system change at a local level, we have to talk about swarm entrepreneurship. Many entrepreneurs working together to hit an outcome. And outcome financing models are opening up really good ways of changing the dynamics of organization. I'm putting this up just for a bit of fun, just to show what happens. OpenDesk is an open source furniture making platform. Why is it interesting? It has created a network, or has been part of building a network of 200 makers around the world, which can build, designers can build, a design a piece of furniture, and the local manufacturers distribute it. Local manufacturers use 3D printing. It means that a local piece of design can be actually turned around and delivered to you within a week, a bespoke piece of design. But it's also creating a whole new micro-massive market. Micro-massive market. In the first four weeks, they had 8,000 downloads. In 24 hours, they sold 10% of their equity. In the first 24 hours on, on Crowdcube, raising over 150,000 pounds. Fascinating how new modes of social organization are changing things. In a way, to be provocative, two seconds? Perfect. So in a way, to be provocative, Maybe, maybe, and this is a thought, is we need a different conversation. Maybe the challenge is openness. How do we in include a radical openness? Now, I'm going to move quickly because I know Filippo is chasing me. Maybe the future is open. Radical transparency. Why? Because actually radical transparency drives inherent morality. Inherent morality, not imposed. The social sector has used finance and corporate governance to drive morality into situations. Yet macroeconomics has always told us, actually, transparency. Transparency about wages. It's not about other people looking at it. It's your ability to be confident about the wage you earn and to be able to justify it. So maybe if we're going to deal with social, we're going to have to deal with transparency and openness in a radically different, powerful way. So I would say the future is, the future is Oslo. Uh, Oslo, yeah, I'm sorry I'm in Turin, I know, but um, Oslo, open, social, and long finance. I'm gonna leave the long finance out. I can do a long speech on long finance, as uh, Philippa knows. But the challenge is, how do we change our finance model to go beyond equity and valuations? This economy will need financing, and it will require a different form of instruments to do it. I'm going to say thank you there, but my invitation is, many of the things that I'm criticizing, I'm part of, right? So don't take any of the criticism personally, but it's an invitation to disrupt ourselves. Because if we don't, I guarantee you, the story that we're in the middle of is going to go in a bad way. We haven't really played with the world. Data science was alluded to. Most of data science stories are not being dealt by the social sector. We aren't talking about the democratization of data science. Most of the data science stories are centralizing power. We need to embrace these things very powerfully and reinvent ourselves to be part of this conversation. So I think you have a great opportunity to reinvent the discourse. You don't have to follow the UK, but actually leapfrog it. That's the opportunity. Thank you, Indy. This is a very good example of Trotskyism applied to capitalism for 